Welcome to Equine Guelph Research Radio, an online podcast updating the latest in equine research, brought to you by SSG Gloves. This week, we look at the relationship between track surface and injury in the performance horse with Dr. Jeff Thomason. He's the Senior Anatomy Professor and Research Coordinator at Equine Guelph. That's on this edition of Equine Guelph's Research Radio, brought to you by SSG Gloves. And you know, no matter what the season, SSG has the right glove for you with the SSG All Weather. The SSG All Weather Glove is ideal for driving, race riding or driving, carriage driving, barrel racing, schooling and show jumping. The Aquasuede Plus Palm is durable and breathable, giving you a great grip, rain or shine, wet or dry. The SSG All Weather Glove. Get it at your local SSG dealer or online at www.ssgridinggloves.com. Dr. Thomason, welcome. Nice to talk with you. Your study goes into great detail in uh, dissecting the hoof and leg and and their various movements during racing or exercise, and and you describe different track surface factors that go into the uh, the risk assessment therein. Could you tell us about those risk factors inherent in the track, such as, uh, you pointed out, shear, depth, and and overall composition, and and why that's important for us to know to uh, prevent injuries in our um, equine athletes? Yes, it fits into the big question of, of how big a risk is track surface in general for injury. I mean, if, if it turns out that only one in a million chance of the track actually contributing to injury, you know, then we'd be looking for other factors. But we also know that most of the major injuries we see occur on the racing track, so there's presumably some track factor involved. And the research that's being done, the main focus is asking what's important about the properties of the track surface, and secondly, how do the properties of the track surface interact with the horse and vice versa. I want to follow that a bit further up, because... Sure. Um, Obviously, there is a correlation, and I understand that you have to take a holistic approach to this uh, in determining how to reduce the injuries, but uh, within its scope, what sort of conclusions were you able to draw as to what might be the the optimal type of track surface? Because this is a debate that goes on forever, you know, artificial as opposed to dirt as opposed to this kind of dirt and so on. Yeah, and I think we're in, in the middle of being able to answer the question. We're starting to find some really good information, but I, I'm just writing or I've been part of two proposals for research over the next couple of years that are going to add more pieces to the puzzle. So the whole jigsaw puzzle, even being able to answer your question of what makes the perfect track we're not going to be able to answer yet it's just so very complicated and among the many reasons that it's complicated uh with every footfall the hoof and the track are interacting mechanically in different ways um and specifically when the hoof hits the ground it's just like a hammerhead hitting the ground it's a very short sharp impact and at that moment the only real mechanical interaction with the with the ground is the hoof itself but as soon as the hoof's planted then the rest of the body collides with that now stationary hoof and drives it forward a little bit and one of the big questions is you know, if that foot is being allowed to slip what is a is, is the Goldilocks question how much is too much how much is too little and how much is just right let me ask you this uh, obviously it, it might not be a question that you can answer because of so many variables you can have a perfect track one day and then the wrong kind of um, humidity the next day and, and it could throw out the whole balance could it not that's entirely possible that's sort of the other factors that affect it I and mean, weather in Canada obviously but but also horses that travel and the ones that go down to florida and race in the winter and then come back up here in the summer they're going to see tracks built of different materials and tracks that behave differently tracks under different weather conditions for a track in one locality the changes in weather from season to season through the the meet can totally change how it behaves and it's not a trivial exercise which is why it needs engineering and scientific study not just gut feel of what works It, it needs some really detailed looking at to be able to answer the the whole question of what is a perfect track. And I think given that that it is a bit of a fluid target, uh, this would require, for example, constant practice by, say, people in the farrier industry uh, to make sure that uh, they're they're shoeing their horses to adapt to a a given track condition. Farriers are one. I would say the track superintendents and their staff are even more um, exposed, whatever, now close to the front line because they're the ones that maintain the tracks and track maintenance extremely important more with dr jeff thomason in a moment but first here's a reminder from ssg gloves 
SSG gloves go hand in hand with champion riders like Eric LeMays, thanks to the SSG Digital with DigiGrip Square Groove technology. It's the ultimate in feel, grip, breathability, and durability with its digital pattern for better grip and wear. Ride like a champion with SSG's digital riding gloves. And remember, if it doesn't say DigiGrip, it's not SSG. SSG Gloves. Online at www.ssgridinggloves.com. Much of the study is of pertinence to the thoroughbred racing community, but I want to shift to the applications that it has for harness racing. Uh, your study itself admits, that, uh, for example, that a major factor in harness track engineering, which is the banking of the turns, is based on engineering principles that were derived for automobiles and locomotives. Do these same principles work in favor of the standard bread, or should we be looking at different types of, of engineering of track services and, and turns and so on. Most of the good work on turns has come out of the standard grid field and, and some of the initial work on that was done more than 40 years ago. I don't think the amount of banking is a problem. Um, certainly if any standard grid track was ever going to be unbanked, that would be a problem, but the standard grid people know that and they've accommodated that issue. Let's talk about the possibility of synthetic standard bread tracks because I know that most recently uh, the Meadowlands was working in conjunction with Keeneland and they were uh, they were experimenting with a sort of uh, poly track if you were for, if you yeah. would for standard yeah. breads. How close are we getting to to something like that where we may see an actual application of, uh, of that principle? I mean the last time I've heard of a, of a synthetic track for standard breads uh, you have to go back 30, 40 years to Windsor yeah, exactly. Raceway and the Turton track. I've heard of the main difficulty with doing that is that you've got two competing demands. You want the horse to go fast, which means you need the, the sulky wheels to right. skim across the surface. But if you've got a surface that's optimal for the horse, it may slow you down. And then you get into problems with the horse having to work harder to pull the sulky. So getting the balance between the horse not working too hard, but there being a reasonable amount of cushion. The main problem with standard bread surfaces for the horse is they're just simply too damn hard. Yes. If I'm allowed to say that. You can, Sorry, you can say yeah. that, sir. And, 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 uh, speaking of somebody who works in the standard bird industry, I, I can agree with that. I'm on a track every morning. And, yeah. uh, de again, depending on weather conditions and whether or not it's, the track has been conditioned, uh, you really are at the mercy of Mother Nature, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. When on a poly track, this is a thoroughbred poly track, mm -hmm. uh, we've done this testing, the horse decelerates at a rate of about 100, sorry, the hoof decelerates at a rate of about 100 G on poly track, which is pretty yeah. high in and of itself. That is. But on a standard bread track, it's anywhere between 200 and 800, so wow. up to eight times as quickly. And that's interesting that, you know, obviously all equine athletes suffer sadly some kind of catastrophic injury but we don't seem to see it so much in in, in the standard breads do we they suffer chronic injuries the, the number of actual um horses breaking down radically on the track is much lower in, during races lower in standard bread a, a couple of things one the track hardness another that in trotting and pacing races we're actually forcing them to go faster at that gate than they would normally normally they'd change up a gear into a gallop so we're, we're making them work harder than they would and put more stress on their bones because of that. Having said that, uh, we know that in the thoroughbred end of things, there are more catastrophic injuries. It, I've always argued that that's a product of breeding and, and breeding too finely. And, and we're, we're, we're building the North American thoroughbred for speed and not for endurance. And as such, we're seeing a lot more breakdowns. Whereas standard breads who still have that line of the old, you know, cart horse way back from the 1800s sure. <laughs> seem to have a bit more uh, durability. And I, I know of, I forget which jurisdiction, but at least one jurisdiction has a requirement for a minimum diameter of the cannon. You know, really? Measured around the cannon and the, ten the tendons in that area just to prevent them being bred for too slender legs. Mm -hmm. Whereas the thoroughbreds, I, I don't know that they've done that. And they're, they're, they're on the verge of being too slender. And if they made the legs a little heavier and the feet a little bigger, they'd probably reduce the number of breakdowns. They just wouldn't gallop as fast. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, you look at uh, Secretariat. He did not like, look like a horse built for speed. Right. And um, he was he was a pretty solid animal all around. Um, so, yeah, so it, would, it wouldn't really, in the long term, it would certainly benefit the horses in thoroughbred racing if they were a little heavier. That is good to know. And I know that your uh, your future research into this will give us an even broader picture and, and, and even get down to specifics. So uh, yeah. we certainly hope that your work in this area will continue. This has been most interesting. I want to thank you for joining us. You're very welcome.